last week I have been in mosque in Rome and I was praying there. It was my first experience and I liked it very much because I have experienced how to pray in church. I see the, uh, for example, icons or statue of Jesus and uh, there are certain feelings, emotions. Very often I cry. Mm -hmm. In mosque I had a different experience. It was, you know, light light feeling, light emotions. Could you explain, please, for our audience, uh, why in Islam, restricted to post faces or mm -hmm. bodies of saints like, like in churches? Yeah. First of all, there are different layers to the question. So it's about why does it trigger you? You're human with a psychology and, uh, and also from a traditional perspective, traditional religious perspective, doesn't matter which major religion, you also have a soul. So different elements of your being are triggered by, um, let's say, religious buildings. And so there's a psychology of religion involved where, um, and you see this for example in Buddhism or Hinduism, Christianity, and Islam then uses, doesn't use images of living things but it still uses imagery it still uses it still uses forms to impact you so it triggers something in you and that has partially to do with your psychology and how those forms those images uh, trigger something within you within deep within you and that mainly has to do is because those symbols represent more than only um, for example an image of Jesus represents salvation, it represents acceptance, it represents um, the idea of wholeness. So it, and those are concepts that are within you deeply wanted and desired. So if you are brought up within the Christian religion and you understand that Jesus represents salvation, it represents the idea of God, God incarnate that reaches out to you and accepts you and uh, forgives you and and that's something we deeply inside want and those images trigger you if a non-christian not brought up with those images to almost the mid all of them the majority of them when they look at jesus they are are not they don't experience um these emotions because it doesn't trigger the idea of salvation forgiveness and acceptance because they don't link the image of jesus with those concepts other religions link those concepts of forgiveness, acceptance, wholeness to other forms, other images, other symbols. So in a sense, all major religions are trying to trigger um, these deep emotions within us through different symbols, different imagery, different aspects. So if you're brought up as a Christian, you know, you recognize it. I, I was uh, raised as a Christian, as a Catholic, and I became Muslim uh, 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 when I was 20. And still now, although I don't believe in the theology of Christianity, I, uh, I still feel the impact of those symbols because I was brought into it, brought up with it. So it triggers my psychology. And and the thing what it does is because all the major religions tries to trigger those emotions within you and not to manipulate you. So it's not about the idea that they're trying to manip manipulate you. All those religions are trying to touch on those deep elements within human nature in their own way. And so when you, if you're a very sensitive person and you come into other buildings from other religions, mosques, temples, you do see that they're trying to trigger those emotions, although... You don't, if you go into a Hindu temple, you don't recognize that, for example, that image of that God is trying to trigger that emotion in you. Because you don't know the story, you don't know the symbol that the image represents. So, uh, in that kind of way, um, masks themselves are not empty of images. They use different symbols to trigger the same emotions. The reason why in Islamic theology, in Islamic thought, images are not 100% forbidden, um, they are, let's say, controlled. So the idea is, is that within religion, in, within the religious ritual aspects of Islam, it is forbidden to use images 
because then you use references within creation, the limited aspects within creation, to point towards the creator that is beyond creation. So the whole idea behind it is that how can you use the image of a human to represent the ultimate? Because a human is limited. And God is without body, without form. And that's something that represents the idea of Islamic theology. That God, is, uh, that God cannot be related to the world to, and things in the world. Animals, any type of form. So in Islam, the idea is to be reminded by God is more a mental concept than, let's say, a physical concept. But in mosques, they still use calligraphy. They use... Uh, because they refer to what, the thing that was sent to the world by God, according to Islamic theology, was not humans, but revelation. The idea of words, text, communication. In Christianity, God sent his son. So he sent Jesus in a human form. So it's logical that in Christianity, you use Jesus as the representation of God reaching out to you. In Hinduism... The, the images of the gods represent the same thing of the divine reaching out to you. The same thing with Buddhism. The Buddhas represent the way how you can reach the divine. And all these different major religions have uh, these different approaches to cross that bridge between the world and the divine, the transcendent. Islam doesn't use uh, references to humans as that crossing over. It uses uh, 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 language as an, as an ideal way to cross it. So, so in mosque you will see calligraphy that either are verses from the Quran, the, the sacred book of Islam, or they refer to uh, um, the names of sacred persons. So you, do, so you do see the name Muhammad in there, although you don't recognize it if you don't know Arabic. But Muhammad is there, but his name is there, not his image. But for Muslims, seeing the name is almost the same thing as seeing the image. And you also with what you have in Catholic churches and in, in, in Orthodox uh, Christianity, you don't not only see Jesus, you see also the other saints, you see references to holy persons. In Islam, you have the same thing. So in a lot of mosques, they would refer, especially in Sunni mosques, but also in Shia mosques, you will see the names of, pe of holy people beyond Muhammad, so his successors, the people, at the, 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 his direct descendants, people from his family, don't see images of it, but, his, but their names. In certain branches of Shi'i Islam, images are normal. So there are aspects of Islam where they don't have issues with images, where they have, um, they have paintings of Ali and, uh, and Hussein and other for them, holy persons, which are, they are the descendants of, Ma of Muhammad, the prophet. So uh, in Shi Islam, uh, images are normal, but they don't believe that those images refer to God. They refer to the holiness of those persons. But in the majority, the, the, the larger mainstream of Islam, which is mainly represented by Sunni Islam, a, a branch within, it's the dominant branch within the Islamic tradition, uh, uh, no images are used. And if you have images, it's mainly in text, in manuscripts, where those images are used, for example, to explain what is an elephant or to show you an, 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 uh, an imagery of uh, a story from the Quran or Bible. So you will get how Moses walked up the mountain or how Ezekiel uh, um, got his revelation or that Jesus walked over the water. Those type of images and references to holy persons are also in manuscripts, but they're part of, let's say, cultural books that use those images to, ex to help you understand stories. And so in that kind of way, uh, but they're not used as religious symbols. They are then used as sources of information. In Islamic architecture, uh, clothing, symbols, so for example, my ring, it has Arabic on it. So uh, um, those type of symbols are used as religious symbols that refer to the transcendent, that refers, reminds you of the divine, and, in the, and it uses the vehicle that the divine itself used. So in Islam, 
text was used, the Quran, to reach humanity. So Muslims use text to refer back to the, the, to the divine. In Christianity, Jesus was used by the divine from the Christian perspective. A human was used, God incarnate, to reach out from the divine to humans. So then you use that symbol to reach back to the divine. And could you tell me shortly about the ornament uh, used in mosques, inside and interior, and also on facades? There are different aspects to the mosque. Well, first of all, the first mo so with churches, Jesus did not found a church. Um, so the churches were built based representing aspects of Jesus' life. So you have, uh, and they mix it also with the Judaic, the Jewish background of Jesus. So you have a tabernacle that represents the Jewish offering table that is also still used in synagogues. So there are Jew in churches, there are Jewish references that then are used to represent the symbols that Jesus introduced. The Eucharist, the drinking of the wine and the hostess. So... Uh, the church itself, and that, it, that churches are technically aligned towards the east, towards Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, to the east from a European perspective. So, um, build, so the Christian buildings ha were, were slowly developed that combined Jewish, Roman architecture to symbolize the rituals that were introduced by Jesus. In Islam, that's different. In Islam, Muhammad himself, the prophet of Islam, he, he already gave a map of what a mosque is because he had a mosque in Medina and later on also he assigned, uh, he also uh, showed what to do in Mecca and also uh, people after him uh, uh, founded different mosques. And then we can see a sort of a uh, uh, general map of what a mosque should have. So a mosque should always have a clean area to pray because, of course, the Muslim rituals are very physical. You have to go to the ground. Uh, in, in Catholic and Protestant Christianity, you don't, there's, there, you, for example, you don't really move to the ground. The ground is not really used as, a, as part of being rituals. In Orthodox Christianity, you do have kneeling. Uh, so, so Orthodox Christianity, Orthodox Christians will recognize it more than, let's say, Western European ideas of Christianity, which are less physical, less embodied. But the Muslim approach is very much embodied. You have three postures of prayer, standing up, qiyam, then if you, you have ruku, and then you have sujud. So the different ways of being human are expressed through that ritual. And so the mosque facilitates that bodily use in the ritual. So you have a clean area to pray on. It has to be purified in a way that it has to be clean. Um, also, uh, uh, there has to be, uh, because rituals are, uh, 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 what you have is you have, like in Christianity, you have somebody who uh, runs the prayer, which is the imam. Imam means somebody who is put forward. Imam is somebody who's followed because he stands in the front. That's an imam. A mama means to be in the front of something. So an imam is the one who stands in the front, and the Muslims behind him follow the imam in the ritual. And um, so the mosque itself is designed that the uh, imam can stand in the front and, the, and people can pray behind him. Also, there's a, like in Christianity, Sunday special, and in Judaism, so Saturday is the Sabbath, is the, uh, is the holy day. In Islam, it's Friday, that's Juma. And then you have a special prayer where also the Imam gives a lecture. It gives, it preaches, and, uh, which is the khutbah, so the addressal towards the community. And Prophet Muhammad, uh, in the beginning, would use a tree trunk. He would stand on a tree trunk. So, he would, so people also the, in the audience can see him. And later on, somebody built for him uh, a stairway, a seat on a stair. So it's a seat, it's, it's uh, a large seat on a stairway. That's a minbar, which means an elevated chair, because what, that's what it is. And he, he then started to use that. So for the chutbah, for, the, uh, 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 the, uh, for to use to preach. 
So that became the prototype of every mask. A mask is not a mask without the minbar, without the preaching chair. Otherwise, it's only a musalla, a, a prayer hall. So we also make a distinction between a masjid, a mask that has also the Friday prayer function, and simply prayer halls, because you also have those that only have a clean carpet where you can pray. So mosques are designed to function like that. In churches, because also, for example, for baptisms, they have a special place, you know, for a special baptism font. So you can baptize children and adults. In Islam, you need, before you pray, you need to wash yourself. You do, again, a very physical embodied ritual of purifying yourself, which is a mix between purifying the body and purifying the soul that is contained in the body. So you wash your face, your mouth, you wash your arms and your feet. And most mosques have um, a, a, a place to wash yourself. So what, same thing what you see with churches and what you see with mosques is everything that is part of the ritual to do the ritual is part of the, of the architecture. But also a mosque is also the place where everybody comes together. So later on, a lot of mosques also started to use, become a community center in that sense. So they had a soup kitchen for the poor. They had a sleeping areas for visitors, for people that are for travelers. They also have a, a maktab, a library, where people can read and study. So a mosque became, is more than simply uh, a ritual space. It is a place to be fully Muslim. Same thing that a church is not only a ritual place, it is where you experience your Christianity in full. And, the, and a mosque does the same thing. But it, it sees you more than only a Muslim or a Christian. It also sees you maybe as a poor person or as a traveler uh, or as a f male or female. So, it, um, um, so in that kind of way, you have different aspects that are used. The signs are very important in our life. Mm -hmm. For example, the mosque in Rome, uh, designed by architect Paolo Portoghese, gives a lot of allusions and replics and phrases from Francesco Borromini, uh, who, is, who was the, the main architect in uh, Renaissance and Barocco time. Mm -hmm. And he uses a lot of uh, semantic things, and also he uses light in his church. For example, San Carlino, which is a masterpiece in Rome, small church, but masterpiece. And, pa pa and Paolo Portoghese uses in his mosque, in his project, also light. And the light works and plays and gives shape. And Paolo Portoghese is saying that he was using also uh, phrases from Sura An Sura An Nur, you said Sura before. An Nur, yeah. Sura yeah. of Light, number yeah. twenty four. Uh, could you explain a little bit widely what is what this Sura means? First of all, of course, um, I don't know what triggered the architect. You know that he uses that Sura, and of course, he can only understand it through translation. So why he was triggered by it, I cannot explain. But I can explain how Muslims and how Islamic thought understands that chapter within the Quran. So the Quran has uh, 114 chapters. Um, and that it's very in that way, the Bible is a collective of books. And each, uh, so the Bible, Biblia in the Latin, refers to a collection of books. And each book has chapters. So Genesis has chapters. You know, the Gospels of Matthew has, uh, Gospel of Matthew has chapters. But the Quran is one book. And it has 114 chapters. And Surah An-Nur, Surah, Surah means something that is closed off. So it, that refers to the idea of a chapter. But Surah also refers to Suwar. It refers to uh, a symbol, an image. So each, and each chapter is named and, uh, um, either because Muhammad, the prophet, said this Surah, this chapter is named such and such and such. And different chapters also have multiple names sometimes. Surah Nur uh, um, 
its name is uh, based on the first verses, where it refers to the light. And Surah Nur is seen as a chapter that was, was revealed in the, what we call the second phase of Muhammad's life, uh, or his second phase of his prophethood. So Muhammad became a prophet at the age of 40, uh, which is also in general human life all over the world is seen as a sort of transition age. Even in modern psychology, they see the age of 40 as the age of where identity uh, becomes known. It becomes something, it's a crossover age. It's also why midlife crisis happens just before it, because it's that transition age. And after 40, let's say something happens, it becomes this stable identity. And so Muhammad became a prophet at the age of 40. And in the first 13 years of his life, he lived in Mecca. He tried to reach out to his people of his city to listen to him, listen to the revelations that he got from God. And eventually he was constantly rejected and he slowly built up followers, but they all got prosecuted because in that sense, there was no religious freedom in Mecca because the, the pagans, the, the, um, the Meccans themselves had a mix of different religions and Islam was criticizing those. And instead of rebuting the critique, they pushed him away because they did not have any rational and emotional answers to that critique. So eventually in Medina, which is a city uh, uh, near Mecca, it's about 400 miles away, uh, so by camels, three days ride, um, that, uh, and the people living there who visited, Medina, who visited Mecca, uh, uh, they liked Muhammad. They were like, you're a good person, you're ethical. He was rejected in his message. Uh, um, and it's interesting also that the Quran says you do, be you do believe that he's a prophet you do believe he's special but you simply don't like the message and eventually people from Medina they heard Muhammad and people started to believe him and in Medina there were a lot of uh, uh, issues between different tribes and they knew Muhammad was a very reliable and, uh, and uh, trustworthy person and they were like if we take Muhammad into Medina he can mediate between the conflicts between the different people. And he wants to live somewhere else. He wants to be with his people somewhere safe where they can live because after 13 years of prosecution, they need a safe haven. Uh, one of the first uh, hijras, so one of the first uh, instead they became refugees, was they went to Ethiopia. So a part of the early Muslims lived in Ethiopia because they couldn't live in Mecca, especially the women, and uh, uh, the, the men that, for example, had uh, uh, the men that could not defend themselves, a lot of the slaves that f fled uh, 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 Mecca and they went to Ethiopia because there they could live freely among Orthodox Christians, the Ethiopian Christians. They could live there in freedom and in safety. Um, if, but the, the Muslims that stayed behind, including Muhammad, went to, uh, eventually was asked, you can come live in Medina. And he did. So this is what is called the hijra, is as in the hijra is uh, in that way. Is hijra means to leave something behind. So he went to Medina with all his followers. And there he could finally really set up a, a religious community. And so you, in the Quran, you see this change in tone. So the, in the Quran, the, the, the verses... And the chapters of the Quran that were revealed in Mecca were talking to the people persecuting them, attacking them. In Medina, the Quran starts to talk to the Muslim community that is now safe and can now live on their own terms. But what does living on your own terms mean? What does it mean? And also now they have to live uh, among Jews, some small, some small individual Christians, uh, pagans and other religions. So suddenly they are now living in a sort of multicultural city and they can now decide themselves how to live. But how do you do that? And the Quran starts to facilitate this new way of living. So there's a, in the Quran, we make a distinction between the Quran verses that were revealed in Mecca during the times of persecution 
you know, the first phase of trying to establish the Islamic religion. And then you have the second phase, which is the Medina phase. So in the Medina phase, suddenly the Quran says, don't do this, do this. Was because in Mecca, that was not really possible. In Mecca, the Quran is mainly focused on mindset, attitudes, what you believe. Because there was not a lot of freedom to do Islamic things. So there are almost no rituals in the Meccan revelations. There are no references to rituals, ethics or law. But in Medina, suddenly these people need rules. So the Quran in Medina st starts to give them rules. And su Surah 24, Surah Anur, the chapter of light, provides light on the rules that are needed in the community. This newly established community, they need a guidance. So Surah Anur is not simply about it being divine light. It's also about how to live as a, as a Muslim, as a collective. So Surah Anur has a lot of collective rules in, in, into it, next to individual rules. But uh, the Quran always mixes different messages. So there's almost no chapter that has 100% rules in them. The Quran doesn't work like that. This is also why a lot of people are confused by the Quran as a text. Because, for example, if you're used to the Bible, it has, okay, these parts of the Bible tell narratives. These parts of the Bible tell give laws. These parts... So, it has a sort of structure. Each chapter in each book has a certain identity. The Quran ha mixes everything. So you can have two verses of laws, and then it talks again about the nature of God. Then it suddenly gives a biblical story, a story of a prophet, history, you know, religious history. Then it suddenly talks about how to be a good person. Then it talks about how to save your soul, how to pray. So it mixes rules, God, being human, being a good person, how to do rituals, laws, it constantly mixes those. And, and one of the reasons why the Quran, the Quran does this, according to Muslim scholars, is because it shows that everything is just as important. Rules are just as important as knowing God, as knowing yourself, as being a good person, to do rituals. So the Quran doesn't, never gives priority to only one concept of being human. It mixes those. And Surah Nur does that. So there are parts of Surah Nur that refer to the light of God. Then it refers to the light of what does it mean to be enlightened as a soul? How to put light on a community by providing rules. So, so the idea of Nur light is used uh, in a philosophical sense, in a spiritual sense, in a legal sense, in a communal sense, in an ethical sense. So what does light mean as a law? What does light mean as an ex spiritual experience? What does light mean as in clarifying your head and your mindset? All these different things are part of that chapter. So I don't know what triggered the architect, but there, is, there are certain verses within Surah An-Nur. One of them is uh, the light verse. And that talks about God. And that says that God is the light of the heavens and earth. And he's like a lamp within a niche. You know, so what, and what does that verse mean? Because God is not a light in a lamp, in a leash, in a physical sense. So there, behind me, you see a lot of these Arabic books. A lot of these are about, are Quran commentaries, to exegesis. Tafsir means to explain the Quran. A lot of these focus on that Quran verse. Because what does it mean for God to be a light of the heavens and earth? Why is God a, la a light in a lamp in a niche? It says, so a lot of people try to explain that metaphor. God is hidden, but you can, do but you can see him. You know? um, and that, that also that, that God, of course, God is never explained as being dark. You see, the same imagery is also in the Bible. God is always light. God is never dark. He's never a shadow. Why? Because a shadow is lacking light. It misses something. My seven-year-old son asked me last week, he's like, Dad, what is a shadow? So I told him, a shadow is not a thing. It, is, it lacks something. It lacks light. So it has no being. A shadow has no being. Light has being. 
So God being a light is understood as a representation of God is the source of all being. And he has activated all the being around us. You know, creation. That's the whole idea of creation itself. So God being a light is understood as God is light. Nur is as understood as wujud, being. And that God is as the light. He is the source of all being. And from his being, everything else arises. So there is no shadow in God. There is no lacking in God. There is no non-being in God. There is only being in God. So that's how it's understood. But I don't know if that triggers the architect, but the most famous verse in Surah Nur is Ayat Nur, the verse of light, which refers to divine nature. The, that divine nature is light, is pure being, and that every, everything that is, everything that has being existence, radiates out of God. We have experience in debunking propaganda of Russian Empire to Chechen people, mm. how badly they treat it, how badly they create image of bandit, for example, mm -hmm. or terrorist even. And uh, we understood how deep it is and how we should work to, you know, uh, create the, the truth uh, to open the truth about great Chechen people. And now we understood the same is, the same propaganda is around Islam. So why there is such Islamophobia in Europe? Because there is a, a huge propaganda around that. Uh, how, how, where this propaganda is coming from? Where is Islamophobia is coming from? And how we should uh, work in cultural way. Islamophobia has technically three phases. And it already started in Mecca, like I just said. It started with the first people rejecting Islam, but also fearing the message of Islam. So the first Islamophobia were by the people of Muhammad himself. That's the first phase of Islamophobia. Of course, eventually they were overturned, they were uh, uh, um, convinced by Islam. So Islam, that proves already that Islamophobia can be conquered in a good way. Um, because one of the things that also convinced a lot of the enemies of Muhammad in Mecca is, of course, he went from Mecca to Medina. A lot of the Meccans started to fight wars with the Muslims in Medina. So the prosecution, the persecution, of Muslims, fighting Muslims. You know, when, when the Muslims went away from Mecca, the Meccans were, still went after the Muslims in Medina. So there were a lot of wars during the time of Muhammad where Muhammad has to, had to defend his community. All the wars that Muhammad fought uh, uh, between Mecca and Medina were around Medina itself. He did not instigate these conflicts with Mecca. Meccans instigated these conflicts with the, with the Muslims in Medina. Eventually, uh, the Muslims became, so many people were convinced of Muhammad that they, the group of Muslims became so big, that the army became so big, that they simply walked into Mecca. And the Meccans believed, okay, Muhammad's going to kill us all, because now he has the big numbers, he has the big army. And Muhammad simply walked in and said, I forgive you all. And almost all people in Mecca became Muslim because of that. They were like, only a real prophet would forgive us and not take revenge. And the people that did not want to become Muslim, they were still not convinced by it, they were allowed to leave Mecca freely, go. So, this was, so Islamophobia was first of all conquered through forgiveness. After that, of course, Muslims started to reach out and branch out. And, uh, and they saw it as their assignment as well, to preach Islam to people that did not know Islam. And these were done in different ways. Some were through wars, some were through simply spreading the message through travelers, Muslims that traveled the world. So most parts of the world became Muslim, not through wars and conquer, but simply by holy Muslims, holy people that were, had pure intentions, were the most moral persons that you can imagine that traveled to areas like India, Indonesia, other, Chechen, by the way, as well, that 
these holy persons would enter those regions and would simply be with those people and talk to them. And, uh, um, and through being that, you know, pure human being, people start to become convinced of it, like there's truth in Islam, there's goodness in Islam. Um, so the majority of people uh, in the world uh, in the first thousand years simply became Muslim uh, because of not only the message itself, but also the purity of the people that brought it. Um, again, from people going from non-Islam to Islam, from non-Muslim to Muslim, is a sort of Islamophobia that is conquered. And, um, but also something else happened, of course, and that is that the bigger the Muslim community became and the more stronger it got and the better organized it got, of course, then it becomes a civilization. Civilizations have armies, they have structures, they need to organize society, they have taxes, they have a whole bureaucratic and administration, and thereby they become rivals, not only of other religions, but also from the civilizations that carry those religions. So Muslim civilization became uh, became in conflict with the Persian civilization, who were Zoroastrian, which is a different religion, older religion, and they became they came in conflict with one another, as two religions, but also as two civilizations, because they were two societal organizations that started to clash. Same thing that Muslims entered Europe, they uh, you know took over parts of Spain, they uh, entered uh, um, also into Georgia and even far across. And there were cultures there, civilizations there, and either they opened up to those Muslims or they eventually they came to in conflict as two civilizations, two organizational uh, uh, um, societies that clashed with one another over taxes, borders, control. And so Islamophobia, in the history of Islam itself was always there, starting with Mecca. But then other societies also gained Islamophobia, either from religious concepts, as in Islam as a rival religion, or Islam as a rival society and rival organizational structures, rival armies. So Islamophobia can be a lot of things. Islamophobia can be a fear of Islam as a religion. It can be a fear of Muslims as a collective. Islamophobia can also be fear of, of Islamic culture that is different. It has different food, different expressions, different ideas about how to engage with one another. You can fear that. A lot of times, that is the culture is the least feared. So although it's said a lot now in a lot of xenophobic talk about we have our own culture, you have your culture, but they're still eating Muslim foods. They like kebabs, they like Chinese food. So, for, so nobody fears food. <laughs> so, it's, so it's very uh, eclectic and very um, opportunistic what they fear. Rarely do they really fear the religion. And of course you had uh, parts of uh, Christian culture that feared Islam uh, and it also confused them because normally the only persons who believed in Jesus were Christians and now Muslims come along. Muslims also believe that Jesus was a prophet. They don't believe he was the son of God, God incarnate. They believe he was a special prophet, that he was the Messiah. So what they do is they believe in Jesus but with a different theology behind it, a different uh, worldview behind it and therefore Jesus is not the savior of the world he is a prophet that brings a message a communication about salvation but he's not the carrier of salvation he is the messenger of salvation that's the so the so Muslim theology tweaks the function of Jesus and the, uh, the idea of what Jesus is so Jesus is still a very special prophet within Islamic theology and the Islamic thought and Islamic mindset, but he's not God incarnate. So he's not the savior of mankind. Um, so suddenly Christians were confronted with an alternative Jesus. And so in uh, pre-modern times, 
So from the beginning of Islam in the 7th century until the 17th, 18th century even, Islam was seen as bad Christianity, as a heresy. So in a lot of he works on heresies, meaning uh, those were theological texts that would focus on wrong forms of Christianity, wrong sects, one, you know, bad, uh, um, bad beliefs, something that makes you, if you believe these things, you're, you're uh, a bad Christian. Yeah? And Muslims were always placed in that aspect as being Christians that understand it in the wrong way. Muhammad misunderstood Christianity. So Islam was, so in pre-modern times, so before 1700, Islam was, was feared as a heresy, as a, be, as a wrong Christianity, but it was mainly feared as an organizational system, as a rival civilization. It has armies, it conquers. So uh, in that way, Islam is seen as being a, uh, as a society with power and the Islamophobia was that it has b wrong teachings about Jesus and it has power. And that's, so that's pre-modern Islamophobia, traditional Islamophobia. Then with the start of the Enlightenment and, and, and European, the rise of Europe as a, uh, as a colonizing, and, uh, col you know, colonizing the world. And that started, of course, with 1492 with the discovery of America. So that's the first major, also the, that the Catholic Church on the Balthasar II gave uh, uh, Pope uh, uh, gave the the, ad the edict that uh, Catholics can conquer America and to and to Christianize it. So that is also uh, and that was part of the Crusades. So the Crusades started in the 11th century, and the Crusades have different phases. So it 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 uh, partially pushed out the Muslims out of Spain. It pushed out Jews out of everywhere. So it pushed out Jews out of Eastern Europe. Um, one of the major persecutions of Jews by Catholic Europe was in Hungary and those areas where Jews were pushed out. Those Jews went to Muslim lands because they were safe in Muslim lands. Also, uh, Christian sects, Christian groups that did not follow the Catholic understanding were killed. And a lot of those fled to Muslim lands because Muslims were like, a, Mus a non-Muslim is a non-Muslim. We don't care in what way you are an unbeliever. You know? So M Muslims were very simple. A kafir, an unbeliever is a kafir. We don't, we, don't, we don't tell you how to unbelieve. It's very simple. So Muslims were like, if you come here and live peacefully, pay your taxes, do what you want. So... Muslims or Muslim society has a very was already liberal in that sense. It already had their own ideas about religious freedom and so, and communities could do their own thing as long as you keep the peace. That's it. Now, so in the 11th century in Northern Europe, uh, um, you get the Crusades in different phases, and then you get the discovery of America and then the Christianization of uh, eastern sides of America, Northern America and South America, and Slowly also because of that, they start to conquer different parts of Africa because, of course, for the slave trade, but also um, because they want to uh, uh, avoid the Ottomans, the Ottomans, the Turkish society that were the dominant society in the Mediterranean. So what so uh, and because the other the, and the Ottomans were in the middle. So you have northern Europe above it and then the Ottomans beneath it with the Mediterranean. If you wanted to trade with China or with India or with Persia, you always had to go through the Ottomans. And the Ottomans tax things. So you always get an extra price. So the way to get things cheaper was to go around the Ottomans. This is also why they w started to sail acro you know, across Africa. Also, the whole reason why Columbus tried to cross the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, thinking he can get to China and India, uh, uh, through the other way. You know, and of course, there's a lot of discussion. Did Columbus knew or expected that there should be lands there where is now America? It has always been expected because in classical thinking, they already knew that the earth was round. There was the idea that the earth was flat was never really a dominant belief. 
but they did believe that it has to be balanced out. So if you have land here on this side of the earth, you also need land there. So the idea that there should be something there was logical to a lot of people, but they didn't know. So Columbus was, I, either I come across something or I end up in India, either way, he's still rich. And so this all is part of that same movement where Muslims were a rival society, were a rival civilization with a lot of power, economical power, military power. Uh, and of course, that their, the way they understood religion was very attractive. And that is something that also, so the, uh, let's say Christianity understood that, that uh, Islam was seen as a very powerful heresy. Same thing that from a Catholic perspective, Orthodox Christianity, who was also seen as the enemy and the heresy, was also seen as a very powerful uh, uh, competitor, in a sense, for souls. So traditional Islamophobia uh, is, is mixing religious Islamophobia uh, uh, um, and, and uh, civilizational Islamophobia. But with the start of uh, the conquering of America, Europe became very rich. And through that, it developed into uh, a high culture that, and, and, and through that influence of Muslim cultures, because a lot of Muslim ideas and cultures and, and knowledge, a lot of these texts were translated into Latin and Hebrew, entered into Europe. And of course, ide new ideas move you always. Same thing when Greek texts were translated into Arabic in the eighth century, it moved Muslims into new thinking. So nobody steals anything in that way. Everybody touches each other. When phobia comes in, you try to deny the influence. You try to tweak it. No, it's ours. You know, we were never influenced by those bad persons because that would mean you have to acknowledge that they have some goodness into them. Because if you take something over, it means you like it. It means it's good. So if you accept, if you acknowledge an influence, you are acknowledging the goodness in the other, which you're trying to reject and push away. So that's the weird thing about any type of phobia, in that sense, cultural phobias. In the Enlightenment, because Europe became very rich, it started to, and also because of technology started to develop, those technologies needed extra supplies. They needed, you know, new, uh, and especially when uh, mechanical technology started to build up, you needed oil, you needed coals, you needed cotton. You know, the, the whole reason why America lived, you know, had the slave trade, uh, had the slavery system, was to sustain the cotton industry. And the cotton industry sustained the factories, especially in England, uh, the cotton factories. If, and cotton factories were new, it means that you can make cloths at the speed which normally would take a year or six, you know, six months to a year, they could do it in one month. So suddenly, before cotton factories, before machines, you needed, so you, you needed a, a cotton supply for a year, suddenly you need that supply of cotton in, for one month. So you need more resources. Same thing with metal. You have this very famous discussion, Adam Smith is one of the American philosophers early philosophers during the early period of America. And he talks about entering into a needle factory. Normally a needle to, for, for a blacksmith to make a needle, it's a lot of work because it's small. And now you had a machine that pushes out 200 needles a minute. And he's like, this is amazing. But also imagine now you need a lot more iron because normally you only need like a, you know, a, a, a year supply of iron Suddenly now the factory needs it for two days. What would be an, an iron supply for a blacksmith, that would be a year supply of iron for a blacksmith, is a day supply for a factory. So technology needs more food, it's hungry, it needs more resources. And uh, to have more, and the thing is, you don't have that in Europe. So they start to colonize other cultures, other lands, simply based on resources. But and this is always true for any society, you want to believe you're a good society. So you start to tell yourself that, oh, but us ruling over you is a good thing. You see it even now with current conflicts. 
that uh, one side is saying, oh, we're going to attack this country and take it over because we're liberating them, we're helping them. It's the same narrative that's centuries old. And we're helping you. And this also happened with the colonization. But then they enter Muslim lands and because what happens with any culture and civilization, they always go up and down, economical powers, any form of structures. And um, so they, could, they entered Muslim lands when certain areas were in, you know, in the low point in their weakness. And they could enter it. And parts of the Muslim, Muslim world, which had still very high structures, they tried to destabilize it so they could enter it as well. And so 90% of the Muslim world became colonized by Northern Europe. And now Islamophobia has a very different tone to it because now Islamophobia is about the people you conquered. So not the rival civilization, but the civilization beneath you. So the narrative changes. Now, Muslim culture is stupid. It, it is barbaric. It's irrational. Because that's the whole reason why they were conquered. It, if they were rational, they, need, they didn't need us. The simple fact that we Northern Europeans need to conquer the world shows that they need us. So Islamophobia changes in its narrative. And now it becomes that we liberate people. We, so you have this idea of Eastern despots, the idea of that in Eastern, Middle Eastern societies, you have a caliph, a sultan who has absolute power, but we have rulers that use parliaments and democracy and the idea of we're going to teach you to be better humans because Islam doesn't teach you to be a good human. It, it, keeps you, it makes you into a stupid, barbaric human. And modernity is going to teach you how to be a better human. So Islamophobia changes. So instead of rival religions or rival civilizations, it's only, it is irrationality versus rationality. In current modern times, starting from after World War II, so after 1950s, this emphasis on individual freedom is emphasized. What we also call postmodernity, the idea that we don't follow any structures, we don't follow tradition. And then again, so in, in, in Enlightenment modernity, you have Islam as the stupid barbarian and, you know, in the enlightened Europe as the rational uh, 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 liberator and enlightened person. And now in postmodernity, you have the free individual and the Muslim that is trapped within this collective groupthink. This idea that they can, that Muslims uh, only think as a collective, as a group. And that's a threat to an individual. So now Islamophobia changes again. Now it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, so first you had rival religions or rival civilizations. Then you had uh, an enlightened European versus the barbaric Muslim. And now you have the individual free-spirited Westerner versus the collective barbaric uh, groupthink Muslims that don't think for themselves. So Islamophobia changes. And especially in Northern Europe, like where we're now here in Holland and Scandinavia in the UK, and um, people are, are very, because they're very postmodern, they're very anti-tradition, so they are very much anti-religious traditions, collective ideas. So they're not specifically atheists, for example, that they reject the belief in the divine and that type of stuff, but they are against structured beliefs. The idea that you have a collective belief system. They reject that. Although they do believe the idea of citizenship and so instead of the Bible, you now have the constitution that is your, you know, your collective identity. So that's also the, the paradox and the hypocrisy of modern postmodern identities is they think they reject tradition, but they simply shifted the source of tradition. Because they believe, why? Because they believe that the constitution and their idea of human rights um, so, by the way, I'm not saying there's a critique on human rights or constitution, but it's the way how it's used in postmodern identity is that the constitution makes me into a free individual, while the Bible and the Quran traps me, takes away my indiv individual freedom, my individual mindset. So the idea that humans can be, that every isolated individual can create their own truth. And religions say, you cannot create your own truth. So... 
Islamophobia in Holland is partially about Muslims being the other, as in being non-Dutch, being non-white, being Arab or Turk. Uh, uh, so it has to do with racism. So part of Islamophobia now in Holland and in Northern Europe has to simply to do with simple xenophobia, simple racism. And again, very selective, because they love Muslim foods. And they love Muslim women, but they don't like Muslim men. So it's also very gendered. You know? um, secondly, they don't like religion. And Islam is a very strong religion. So the Islamophobia in Northern Europe, especially in the northern part of Northern Europe, uh, is very much so combines this racism, and especially male racism, because they want to liberate females, of course, uh, emancipation, their idea again of emancipation, their approach to emancipation. That, so there's this idea that this combination of racism and anti-religious, so religiophobia, that is the version of Islamophobia you now see here in Northern Europe. Islamophobia in Italy is very different from Islamophobia in Spain, in Holland, in France, in Belgium. They have overlaps and they have some similar ing ingredients. Um, they all don't like Muhammad as a prophet. That's one main ingredient, for example. But in a religious country uh, uh, where religion is normal, like India, uh, they're not anti-religion. So they're mo mainly focused as Islam being the wrong religion, which is a very traditional Islamophobia as a rival religion, and that Muslims are sort of invaders. They are the, the ones that came from the outside. So it's a different form of racism involved. Each country, same thing with the Chinese and others and others. Islamophobia has very local expressions. And you need to look at, is it, in what ways is there religiophobia involved? Is it religion that's the issue? Or is it rival religion that's the issue? Is it about a certain type of racism? But what type of racism then? Is it white versus brown? Or for example, like in India, this type of, you know, type of caste versus this type of caste, and all those different things. So Islamophobia is, um, uh, um, you cannot have a general Islamophobia, but it has some general ingredients into it. And the hate for Prophet Muhammad is very central in it. And the idea that Muslims are taking away your identity. These are very much sort of the grand myths of Islamophobia. And there are more, and I'm not a scholar of Islamophobia, uh, there are some very good ones, including my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Jeroen Vleug, Martijn de Koning, and there are some others also that are experts on this. Um, uh, but this is how I view it from my understanding of religious history, is how I would explain it. And then architecture becomes very interesting, is that how can architecture be an expression of Islamophobia or an antidote to Islamophobia? So, for example, in in Spain, a lot of the old Muslim buildings became Catholic. They were integrated into Catholic identity. Same thing that happened in Muslim lands with, for example, the Hagia Sophia, which is the center of Orthodox Christianity, and it became Islamicized. Again, this is normal for dominant civilizations to use the dominant architecture as an expression and symbol of their power. So that's normal. So when Muslims in a sense, uh, talk about Muslim Spain as a loss, which of course is, ex is understandable, especially because they were pushed out through crusades. At the same time, they forget that Muslims did sometimes the same things in their own areas. But of course, different ethics and different situations were involved. You cannot completely compare it. Uh, the Hagia Sophia became part of, you know, was used by Muslims because the Orthodox community in, in Istanbul, Constantinople was very small. They, and Muslims needed, a, now the new Muslims taking over, needed a lot of space. So it's also logical that the dominant civilization and the dominant group take over the dominant buildings because also they need them. So there's also a pragmatic idea behind it. Um, so architecture itself, when you look at it, uh, after the, you know, because of the Crusades, when, Christi when Northern, Christ Northern European Christians enter into the Middle East, into Muslim countries, they, of course, were exposed to it, to the, and they were influenced by it, and that those influences were taken back into Europe. So after 1200, you see the rises of universities. These did not exist before. And 
these came about through two main influences. One is the exposure to Muslim educational systems in Muslim lands, because the Crusaders conquered parts of Muslim territories and ruled over them. And so suddenly they had a madrasa, a Muslim university, and like, oh, that's an interesting structure, that's an interesting system. So those type of uh, educational organizations were introduced into Europe when they went back to Northern Europe. And also second influence was in law. Muslim law, Islamic law, the Sharia, if you use the scary word in Islamophobia, is, uh, has this idea of what is called waqaf, which my colleague, uh, uh, the, the director here at the Islamic University of Applied Sciences Rotterdam, is one of the world's experts on it, on the idea of the Islamic foundations, foundational law, uh, Hassan Bouyazduzen. And uh, a waqaf is simply a foundation, meaning it has uh, a fund at, uh, and a certain type of money, and this endowment is used for a special purpose. And nobody owns it. There's so a foundation doesn't have a single owner. Not a king, not a, a family. It is owned by the purpose. So if you have a foundation for taking care of dogs, the dogs own the foundation. And the foundation facilitates this purpose. This type of thinking, you had charities in Christian thought. But these charities were, did not had a type of, uh, so these were religious organizations as charities. The whole day, uh, because they represented, chari charity in English comes from caritas, to take care of. But they did not have it in a way that Muslims had structured it in Islamic law, that a foundation is owned by God. Meaning nobody can touch it. And even, for example, libraries were public. Meaning, so in old books, you have stamps that says, this is a haq Allah, this is a right of God. Anybody who steals it will have to defend themselves in front of God and will enter into hell. This is, in this way, you're not going to steal the book. You can loan the book, but you're not going to steal it because you're going to end up in hell. It's a different way of approaching it. So the idea of foundation, for, and, and they build whole legal structures around it. Charities didn't, in, in Christian thought, and European thought, charities did not have these complex legal structures around it. Universities are free spaces of intellectual thinking. But if a, a seminary is owned by the church, so you had very intellectual thinking in churches, that's in, in church educational systems. That's, it's not about rationality per se being used or not. But in a university, univer in a university, they, not, they are not... Uh, be, uh, uh, the first universities founded in Europe were after the Crusades, and they combined the Muslim educational system with the Muslim foundational law that was introduced. Because this is how it is run in Muslim countries. A Muslim madrasa, a Muslim university, is not owned by anybody. It is a foundation. So, and people, it's normal for you to leave, you know, you know, in their will when people die, they would say, oh, 20% of my wealth goes to you know, that university. So th this is how universities in Muslim lands sustained itself without I political influences or elite influences, which of course there's always influence, but at least the idea behind it is that a university is a safe space where people can generate new ideas, even if those ideas can be threatening to political thinking. The, so this double concept of free space, intellectual space as a university, and that you need a legal structure, the foundation for it, entered into Europe. And this is how the first universities were created. created so that is a form of influence from Muslim influence on Europe that created, let's say, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the whole, uh, let's say, started it up in a European setting. So Muslims don't own the Enlightenment, but they provided the structure that the Enlightenment needed to be there. And same thing with uh, uh, the way hospitals were run. The first hospitals, uh, the way that we know them now, the structure of it, this is how Muslims had created it in their own systems. Uh, same thing also, the hospital was open to everybody. Anybody that had an injury could enter a hospital and was treated for free because it was an endowment, a foundation. It was run, it was owned by God. And God owns everybody. So nobody's rejected. 
And so, and same thing with mosques. They're not owned by a sultan. They're not even owned by a church because in Islamic thought, there is no church as in a general directive. You, of course, have high authorities like a Sheikh al-Islam, the Grand Mufti, but they don't own the structures. The structures are owned by God. That's the whole idea behind it. So they're foundations. So the architectures represented all those elements. And, um, and what do you see now is that mosques in Europe and also in a lot of other countries uh, that were, are not dominant Muslims, so where you have Muslim minorities, is that mosques, uh, first of all, served a direct Muslim com local community. But now more and more, you you're seeing you get mosque structures that not only serve the Muslim community, but also the general community around it. And so you have, for example, a mosque in Utrecht here in Holland, which is at the center of a marketplace. And it has even a prayer room for non-Muslims, where Christians can pray and Buddhists can meditate and whatever. It has a public restroom where people that visit the market can, if they need to go to the bathroom, they enter the mosque. So in this way, that mosque is a community center now where the mosque is only an element of it because it serves the public. So a lot of non-Muslims enter into it and they're like, oh, this is interesting. There's a beautiful restaurant beneath it as well. A lot of non-Muslims eat there. They're like, oh, this is nice. And this is all a mosque. So in, that's a very smart way how you can take away the barriers that creates Islamophobia. So, there are, so architecture is a very important method also because architecture has something very stable to it. You cannot push it away. You cannot extradite uh, a mosque you know, to another country. This, of course, what you do see happen in a lot of countries where mosques are destroyed because, they're, because that's a form of cultural genocide. Because in that way, you can destroy the history of the presence over there. Also, by the way, it happens to Christians that the Christian history of a country is destroyed to delete this idea that Christians are normal to be there. Same thing with Muslims. If you destroy their mosques, you destroy the, the normalcy that they are there, that they should be there. Because uh, architecture grounds, literally grounds you to that land. So therefore, architecture is a very telling sign of Islamophobia and what types of Islamophobia. And um, uh, in a sense, it's sort of the canary in the mine. When buildings are destroyed because they're, for example, a type of building like a church or a mosque, and they are destroyed because it's a mosque or that it is a church, that's a canary in the mine. That means you've reached the phobia to a certain stage that you now get a form of cultural genocide where you destroy the grounding of that identity within that geographic surroundings. But if you build, if you, even though, for example, in Holland, there is Islamophobia. There's a general Islamophobia. But mosques are being built in a high rate, which also, for a lot of people, they're like, oh, th they're expanding. There are more mosques around us. But at the same time, it is allowed in Holland. The, we here have, are at the Islamic University of Applied Sciences in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. We have our own institutions, education institutions. That means, although there's Islamophobia, at the same time, there's this. In, we can see there's no Islamophobia in the architecture because things are being built. So although Muslims as individuals are being harassed, they are being discriminated as for their headscarf or being Moroccan or uh, other ways of being different. At the same time, as long as Holland, as a democracy and legal structure, allows Muslim architecture to expand, it means that the architecture is doing the opposite of the Islamophobia. So in that kind of way, it's a very interesting measurement of, you can say there's Islamophobia or experience Islamophobia by individuals. But at the same time, in the architecture, we see the opposite direction. We see an increase of Muslim architecture, an increase of Muslim organizations, Muslim buildings, Muslim uh, mosques, uh, schools, Islamic primary schools, and secondary schools and high schools. In that kind of way, we see this increase 
of Muslim architecture in Holland, in the Netherlands, and also in other non-Muslim lands. And that architecture technically should be a sort of opposite Islamophobia, a counter-Islamophobia. Sometimes it's also to control Muslims. So sometimes you have that countries establish mosques to show I'm the defender of my Muslim minorities. But they, they, they do it to control those Muslims, to tame them. And um, so architecture is a very important um, uh, um, thermometer, uh, measurement to understand what type of Islamophobia is involved there. And, and also, it, sometimes it can be deceiving. Like, oh, Muslims are allowed to be here fully Muslim because I build a mosque for them. But it's sometimes, it's, so either it's a symbol of, free, of religious freedom or it's a, a symbol of religious containment. Mm -hmm.